right, so I'm Jeff Raleigh with Learberg, and today I have Tyler Muto here, and we're very fortunate to have Tyler up here this week producing one of the online courses for our online training program. However, uh, today I don't want to talk about his online course. Before Tyler got here, he was in St. Louis last weekend for the IECP's conference down there, and I knew about the IACP, but I didn't know all the details and what their organization does for dog trainers and dog owners throughout the world, really. And until you and I got a chance to sit down last night and you really kind of laid it out for what you guys are doing, I was kind of unaware of all of the things that you guys are doing. So I'd like to uh, take a minute for Tyler to explain what the IACP does and talk about it a little bit. Sure. Um, so for, for those that don't know, IACP stands for the International Association of Canine Professionals. Um, and we're commonly known as a professional association. And so we do a lot of the same functions as many other professional associations as far as um, helping to provide insurance to dog trainers and those kinds of things. Uh, but I think what a lot of people don't know is what I think is the, the biggest um, service that the IACP provides which is really um, combating against closed-mindedness in the dog training community. Mm -hmm. um, some of the viewers here may or may not know that the dog training world is somewhat political. And there are... Um, That's an understatement. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And there are quite extreme factions in there. And some of those groups um, really seek to, uh, to ban the um, tools that dog trainers use mm -hmm. um, and to really push their own agenda and it's not always really serving the best interest of dogs. And so, um, you know, the IACP is really an organization that's out there trying to fight against this and trying to make sure that dog trainers and dog owners who are gonna be responsible have the right to utilize whatever tools and equipment are gonna help them to achieve success they need, which is ultimately gonna really help to keep dogs out of shelters and to keep dogs alive and in their homes, which is really an important issue to me. Right, and I mean, there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings of what these tools are, and I think a lot of that comes from people that are inexperienced that are going to go out and use these tools in the wrong way and set a bad example. So by having an organization such as the IACP, you guys are able to actually get out good information and explain what these tools are, why they're important, and exactly things like that for an e-collar, for example it's a lot safer to have an e-collar on your dog and know that you have a reliable recall than live in town and have no fence and your dog runs out and gets hit by a car. I think that there's a lot of people out there that refuse to use an e-collar and could have saved some dog's lives had they opened up their eyes and learned about these tools. Yeah, the electronic collars are probably one of the most common tools that seems to excite some of this vitriol out of mm -hmm. certain parties. And when we look at the electronic collar, it serves a lot of very important functions in the dog world. So one of the simpler ones is basically what you just described, which is giving dogs off-leash freedom. We have evolved into a society which isn't really that conducive to dogs. And so if we don't have dogs that are reliably trained off-leash, then our dogs are kind of always quarantined behind walls or stuck on leashes. And they're never really given the opportunity to just let loose and be a dog. And right. me personally, I think one of the most beautiful things you can do with your dog is to let them run off leash, maybe go hiking in the woods, go camping. I know you like to fish and it's wonderful if you can bring a dog with you on those fishing trips. So, um, you know, for the benefit of the dogs, making sure that we have um, safety nets in place um, allows us to, to keep our dogs with us and integrate them into our lifestyles without always restricting their freedom so much. Mm -hmm. I think more importantly, the electronic collar uh, serves as an extremely important tool for helping to manage problem behaviors for a lot of dog owners. And there's a lot of families out there that would be really, really struggling if it weren't for the electronic collar and other tools such as, you know, prong collars, which again could be used in very, very humane ways. Um, I think a lot of the problem comes in because when electronic collars were first created back in the early 1950s, uh, they were really powerful. Uh, they, they weren't adjustable and they were essentially used as the bigger stick. It was when we've exhausted all possibilities, now we're gonna really let the dog have it. And uh, they would really kind of send the dogs through the roof. And just like everything else in technology, um, things have evolved quite a bit since then. 
And I would say technology and dog training. Dog training is a ever evolving exactly, system. Exactly. And, and so what we have now are systems that allow us to work on levels that are almost imperceivable. And so to give you a frame of reference, um, the electronic collars that we commonly use go from zero to a 100. And the average human does not feel the collar until maybe a 20. Most of the dogs that we work with are being trained on levels at 10 or below. And so we're working on levels that are certainly not painful or uncomfortable, but they're allowing us to reach out and touch the dog and essentially communicate with them precisely even when they're at a distance from us and they're not on a leash. And that ability is invaluable when you're trying to manage some problem behaviors, even around the home. I mean, remember, off-leash behavior starts in your living room. Right. Right? So if my dog's across the room from me, an electronic collar can be an incredibly valuable tool. And I can pretty much assure you that if they were banned in this country, we'd see far more families having to give their dogs to shelters yep. and far more dogs being euthanized. And unfortunately, that's already the reality in many countries in Europe where these tools are banned. And so what the IACP is trying to do is sort of twofold. One, we want to make sure that these tools remain legal in the countries where they are already legal. And then we want to be able to reach into those governments where they are, um, have been banned and try and further educate people that these aren't the crude, archaic tools of the past. And that not only has the technology advanced, but the techniques by which we use them have come a tremendously far away. And it's not even remotely close to what was done in the past. The mm -hmm. modern electronic collar is a tool for enhancing communication, for enhancing your relationship, and for actually many times being softer with the dog than we'd be able to be with many other tools. Right, and you had mentioned the dogs work on very low levels, so coincidentally we had just today conditioned my 10-month-old lab puppy to the e-collar and we were working him at a level four. So 99% of people are never going to be able to even feel a level four. You can put it on your face and hit it on continuous and you're not going to feel anything. Yeah. And it's something like that where a Stimulation at a level four from an e-collar is a lot less invasive than pulling on even a flat collar. If you're going to pull a dog around on a flat collar, you can cause more damage than you are at a level four on an e-collar. And I, I think the biggest thing to get across here is that you know we aren't an e-collar association. We aren't a um, balanced training association. We're an inclusive association. Right. Meaning we welcome clicker trainers. We welcome people who train with reward-only methods as long as they don't bash people who mm -hmm. use other tools. We want to get all perspectives in and we want to be open-minded to just about everything out there. And so that's really what we're trying to create is a big family right. and we, we are against negativity. And with that, so kind of getting back onto your conference this past weekend, you guys had several dog trainers down there from kind of uh, all walks of life, Absolutely. if you were to say. So Michael Ellis, who most of the people here at Learberg know of Michael Ellis and have seen mm -hmm. his DVDs. And then you guys had several others, including yourself and Josh Moran, who's another instructor here at Learberg. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk for a minute there about how or what those talks were on and kind of what the things that you guys covered at your conference were? Yeah, so I'm not going to go into every little one because we had, a, right. we had a, actually a, a large number of speakers. It's a really cool conference. Um, so Michael did a great talk on uh, what dogs are capable of knowing and how that influences essentially the ethics of using punishment. So it was a really, really open dialogue about the use of punishment and a very intelligent dialogue. Um, Josh and I gave a presentation on the benefit of aiming for ideals uh, you know, as a professional. So understanding what um, you could do with training if you had an endless amount of time and clients that had endless resources and patience um, essentially, you know, the value of starting with a reward-based model, even if you know that down the line you may have to introduce some corrections into your training program. Um, we had Brenda Aloff there who did a wonderful presentation on canine body language. Um, Pam Martin was a woman I've never heard of before, and she's uh, very well known. I think she's world-renowned for um, disc dog work, so frisbees. Right. And she did a really, really entertaining and engaging presentation on all the different ways that you can teach dogs to have fun um, catching frisbees and doing various tricks. Um, and then we had Brother Christopher from the Monks of New Skeet, along with Mark Goldberg, giving a very nice presentation on uh, what they called the other 23 hours. So, you know, I think we know that dog training really takes a small uh, time commitment, right? You, mm -hmm. you do 20 minutes a day, maybe an hour a day at the most, and that's dog training. 
but there's the, another 23 hours of the day that you can use in a very valuable way um, to, to enhance your relationship and enhance your dog's behavior. Um, and then we had Bart Ballone there, who is a very well-known um, competitive um, coach, really, these days um, from Belgium. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, it just goes on and on. We, we, we had quite a few speakers there, so that's just a small handful of them. Well, it sounds like uh, it was an interesting weekend. Got to learn a lot, got to learn yeah, a yeah. lot from a lot of people. I wish that I would have been able to make it down there. But next year, I'm yeah. going to uh, not miss out on that. Yeah, we have a lot of fun. You had, you had told me last night that you had about 350 people come to uh, the conference this past weekend, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I guess, what uh, can you tell our customers, or our users of our website, kind of what the benefits for them would be to join? So. A lot of the people that were down there this weekend are professional dog trainers such as yourself that are down there networking and learning from everybody. But I think that the organization as a whole is a great thing for all dog owners and dog trainers, regardless of whether you have a dog training business, Absolutely. you're an avid dog trainer that does it as a hobby, or you just have a pet dog that you want to be well behaved. I think that the organization kind of has things for everybody. And can yeah. you talk a little bit about the benefits and the reasons for joining the IACP? Absolutely. So um, obviously we have professional levels of membership that provide some of those professional benefits that I already sort of mentioned um, as far as, you know, helping to get insurance, um, resources for growing your business, etc. cetera. Um, we have associate levels of membership though um, that are really geared for just dog owners and enthusiasts. Um, so I have several clients that are members of the IACP now and, um, you know, we do provide some educational resources, which are really beneficial. But I think for me personally, the, the overarching reason that I joined the IACP was because I recognized that whether or not I join, you know, essentially whether or not I ever give this organization a dime, they're out there supporting me, right? They're mm -hmm. out there supporting my right to train dogs in the way that I know is most beneficial. And if that organization's out there doing that for me regardless, then I want to support them. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to support an organization that believes in what I'm doing and is supporting what I'm doing, because I'll tell you, you know, like I already said, um, some of the dog training tools have already been banned in various countries because right. there are groups out there that make a lot of noise, that have a lot of numbers behind them um, that are quite extreme in their beliefs. And it's only a matter of time before that stuff comes to America. And if we don't have a unified voice that has numbers behind it, we're going to have a really hard time. And I think that's probably the most important reason to join the organization is, you know, uh, most of your viewers and most people that are customers of Learberg um, value uh, a variety of training tools. And we want to make sure that they can continue to use those training tools. So I think it's an it's a important thing to remember that this is a membership based organization. And well, you're the vice president of the organization, which is an elected position on the board of directors, the organization couldn't exist without all of the members. And we're going to go ahead and in the description of this video, post a, paste the link to their website. And I recommend that you go on there and read all the information and join this organization because it's something that, as you've heard from Tyler talking, it's a necessary organization to kind of protect what we have as dog trainers here in the United States and hopefully go beyond that later on down the road once uh, you guys have really become established here in the US and you're able to get over into Europe and start working with some of the countries where these things have already been banned. But anyways, check out the link, go on there. Tyler, thanks for sitting down with us. I just wanna uh, mention cool. one last thing, yep. um, just, just to, to throw it out there, um, just to make clear that we are a nonprofit organization. Right. Right. Um, and myself as the vice president, I'm a volunteer. Right. And so is the rest of the board. So, you know, we're not lining our pockets. Uh, mm -hmm. We really are trying to contribute to the industry, and I think that's uh, just... And it's, it's not very expensive. It doesn't, it doesn't cost very much to yeah. join your organization. Yeah, you so. can join as an associate or an affiliate for uh, $75, I believe, for the year. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. Sounds, Sounds good. good. Thanks, All Josh. Right. Well, thank, thank you. you.